path in our study through the New Testament. We uh, make it to the book of 2 Timothy today. And uh, before we look at it, we'll <clears throat> kind of do a little, I guess you can call it a little bit of a preview of the, uh, the actual book itself. And a couple of observations that we see, uh, especially in this first chapter. And I, I know I've said it before, I mean, you've maybe even thought of it yourselves, but there are those times when you will run across passages in the in the text and realize not only that it's it's very personal between maybe even just two different people or be, between uh, Paul in, in the case where he would be writing to a particular church, but the, the things that are happening at their times um, are things that are known very, very well to them. And so what we're looking at oftentimes is a very descript bit of history and historical events and accounts that they know far better than we could ever possibly know. And uh, in, in this book here, I, I made mention of it when we were in 1 Timothy, this book has a much more personal kind of a feeling. And um, with Paul, there's definitely a history that he has with Timothy. And uh, there's a history that he's familiar with before Paul came into the picture. Because he mentions by name uh, not only uh, Timothy's mother, but also his grandmother. And their very much instrumental role in uh, in his life. And so... It's an interesting thing when you take into account, sometimes we're we got to be rem reminded of something. We're reading a history that is very unique to the people who are, are reading it. And because of that, there are some times that though we can read it and it's in, you know, from Greek to English, we can kind of put some pieces together. But we genuinely don't know a lot of times when it comes to uh, maybe places where, where they had been. But more importantly, when people are mentioned by name. We have no clue who these people are. There are a number of them that are mentioned here, or several of them that are mentioned just in this first chapter, and we have no history on it. But that's when, at a time like that, and it's towards the latter part of the chapter, we'll see that when Paul says this to Timothy, Paul wouldn't have to explain who these people are. Paul knows who they are, and so does Timothy. These are people who would have been very close to Ephesus. We know that, uh, like with Priscilla and Aquila in particular, um, we know that they were from that part, and they'll be mentioned later on in the book. But we know from Acts that uh, that they were people who were uh, part of, of the church there at Ephesus. So, again, it's just kind of a, a really cool thing. And as we expand it a little bit going into the rest of the book, there are those, those things that Paul will say. And it's good to step back from the text every once in a while and just remember how very human these people were. And uh, since we have so much of the, the New Testament is, is written by Paul, volume-wise, not as much necessarily as chapter and verse, but for the number of books that we have, the things that Paul has to say and the things that, that, uh, that he does that are so instrumental in the, uh, the beginning of the church, we want to be reminded that he's still very much a human man. And his expectation, his excitement about various topics are evident. And when he talks about the end times, and he has that, there's a lot of that in this book. When he talks about the end times, whether he does it here or the ones that he writes to the Thessalonians or the Corinthians, when he starts to talk about end times kind of scenario types of, of uh, events, you can tell he really expects that these things are going to be taking place in the very near future. There are some who, when they read the book of Second Timothy here, uh, believe that um, that Paul is very close to his martyrdom, and uh, mainly because of the things that we see in the in the uh, end of the last chapter, and uh, where he talks about you know kind of running the race and being poured out and all of that, and some people would think that he's looking very much towards the end, while there are people that look later on in the in that chapter where he talks about in the very final things. Um, hey, when you come, Timothy, then um, bring these things. I have need of them. And some people would look at that and say, well, um, he obviously isn't really expecting to be put to death anytime soon because he's asking for things. And it does. it's not like they just show up overnight from Ephesus. It would take a while for them to travel to Rome. And there could be a bit of or an element of truth to both of those things. And here it is as far as believers. We can be in the place of expectation that the Lord could return at any time. But at the same time, we want to be also very, very careful and just say, but if not, then the Lord may have things that he wants to do down the road. And uh, it, it, we want to believe that it could be any time, and yet we don't want to be 
in a place of being discouraged because it didn't happen right away. And, you know, if, if the Lord leaves us here, let us do this. And so for him to be able to say to Timothy, um, when you come, if you get a chance to be here, bring those things with you, assuming that time could go by. But then also that idea of thinking that there very well may be an end to his life because of his imprisonment and, and uh, obviously some hostility that's happened, some things that are even mentioned of people abandoning him. So, you know, you can say, you could actually make the case for either or or both. And so is it that Paul really believes that it's at the end of his life or is he really thinking, no, there's still plenty of time, bring those things with you. The way to kind of marry those two things together is to say, the Lord may be returning at any time. I'm poured out. It's the end of my things. And really, it's time for you to pick up. But should the Lord tarry and you do get a chance to make it to me, bring those things with you. So it's just one of those things. Again, people love to debate that kind of stuff. But I pretty much just write it off to this. I, I genuinely believe that uh, that Paul is a, a person who had the expectation of the Lord's return at any time. Uh, also, at the same time, he wanted to be very, very cautious and uh, wondering whether or not if he's going to give the cautions that he does, telling Timothy about these things that are going to be down the road, yet talking about his time being kind of at an end. I I tend to, to be in the camp that thinks Paul doesn't really believe that he's here for very long as far as the world is concerned. Um, and that thinking that for Timothy, and as we approach those last days, uh, should I be gone and, and you're still here, here are the things that you need to be aware of. Uh, did a little bit of that in First Timothy, and he's going to do a lot of it here in Second Timothy. So with that as kind of the backdrop, uh, we have in the very first uh, parts of the chapter, there is the, the, uh, the typical uh, greeting that Paul would give to uh, to Timothy to pastors like uh, like like what he does also with Titus, and then it it, it does kind of go through a little bit of here's kind of your history and here's where you come from and then it gets to the place of encouragement, and uh, then it is the the you know stay with this Timothy don't become discouraged and and don't uh, don't get to the point where you want to ever give up. And then Paul says, because I haven't, even though he is in his chains. And so this would be a great, uh, a great way of, of kind of realizing what it's like when a pastor is passing along ministry to another pastor, an older man uh, passing to a younger man. And uh, the, the encouragement that would need that would be needed to that person taking that place. So really, really interesting. Um, again, one of my favorite books to teach and uh, has some very memorable quotes but I like this, that we'll be able to read it in its rolling context rather than, you know, looking at a particular chapter or, or a particular set of verses all by themselves. It's always best to read everything in a, in a kind of a flowing context as it's one letter that's being written from Paul to Timothy. So uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, let's have a word of prayer and let's dig into the text. Father, we do thank you as we uh, have this time to study your word. We pray that you would give us understanding as we read and uh, that we would make proper application to our own lives. Knowing that there is much of this history to us, uh, we may know little bits and pieces around the edges, but we certainly don't know it in any, any kind of detail as it was known to both Paul and Timothy. So Lord, would you help us in our understanding and uh, grow us in our relationship with you as we study your word. May we, uh, may we understand the things that you would have us to learn and to know. And we give you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Timothy says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. So the life is the eternal life that is found only in and through the person of Jesus. But Paul makes this statement about being an apostle. And uh, he mentions this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about a, an apostle born out of due season. Because let's remember, in the time that Jesus was uh, in his earthly ministry and the other apostles were there with him in those three or so years, um, Paul would have been an enemy against those things. Uh, Paul clearly was one who was uh, looking to do violence to the church after Jesus' resurrection. And we get that from chapters uh, basically 7 and 8. And we get a real good indication of that. And then when he finally meets the Lord on the way to Damascus in chapter 9. So if we want to kind of get a, a glimpse for what Paul was before and after 
he meets Jesus face to face. Your chapters to look through that is the stoning of Stephen, the martyr, the first martyr of the church in chapter 7, and the kind of havoc that was released upon the church there in Jerusalem in chapter 8 to where it caused the church to scatter outside of the city and then Paul pursuing them as far as Damascus before the Lord uh, confronts him on that. So interesting, interesting history, but Paul would recognize this this apostleship, <clears throat> this one that God would send as being on par with the rest of them who were there with Jesus, and yet he was one who came in at a much later time. Um, chosen by God to do the things that he does and that, that he would do and uh, had been doing up to that point, and then also realizing that he had seen the resurrected Jesus. And we know that this is the case, not only from what he, he saw in uh, Acts chapter 9, but he makes a very interesting statement in the book of Galatians about the time that he spent directly with the Lord for three years before God put him into a full-time kind of ministry that he would uh, ultimately have. So his greeting to Timothy in verse 2, uh, referring to him as a beloved son, he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus, uh, from Christ Jesus <clears throat> our Lord. Notice the two persons that are mentioned here. It's important that we do recognize that, that there is not just the Father, but there is also the Son. And so uh, Paul affirming that there is not just one, as, uh, as some of the um, uh, some people teach even in our days, that Jesus is the Father, is the Son, is the Holy Spirit. They are spoken of here, two parts of the three, uh, the triune God, absent the Holy Spirit in this greeting. Two of them are mentioned independently of one another. So, he says this in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. And uh, again, I, I kind of love, this is what we have <clears throat> in uh, verses 3 to 5, um, as Paul says what he says here, that he thanks God whom he um, uh, serves with his pure conscience. He has this, this time of remembrance. And so, he says, um, as did my uh, forefathers... As uh, without ceasing, I remember you in my prayer night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. So this pure conscience, again, you can read through these things and read right past them and stop for just a moment and say, I, let me just speak for myself. I look at a guy like Paul and say, what a, what a, what a tremendous example Paul is for what would be a model believer, I would think. And uh, for him to be able to say that he has a conscience that is pure, it is not in any ways stained or contaminated. Now, Paul is the same one that would tell you that there are those things that he wishes to do and he doesn't do those things. And there are those times when you can see that he struggles wanting to be even better than he is, and yet to be able to say that you can have a pure conscience. So the question is, is that somehow contradictory? Uh, to which I would just reply, of course, it's not contradictory. It just tells us that we can stand before God, pure of conscience, and then uh, not in any way thinking that somehow we are perfect and without sin. So at the end of the day, when we come before the Lord, we can say, I am forgiven and I'm in the right place where where uh, I should be with you, Lord. And, you know, I'm, I'm in fellowship with you, though there are things that we may very well want to acknowledge and confess before the Lord, uh, places where we have failed and, and not measured up as we should have. But that doesn't change whether or not we have a pure conscience. The pure conscience comes from the fact that even if we have imperfection, we come before the Lord for cleansing, and that's what puts us in that right place. So let's not think for a second that Paul is in any ways contradictory. And boy, what a challenge. We want to be able to say at the end of each day that I can say that I stand before God with a clear conscience because I am forgiven and cleansed, and I, I live according to the grace of God because of his mercy, and yet at the same time, I'm in no ways perfect, and we're all prone to failure. It's what happens when failure comes in and how that's addressed and whether we come before the Lord and seek cleansing. So he says, this is the God that I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayer night and day. And what a what an encouraging thing that would be for Timothy, because we do get a little bit of an impression here that Paul is really trying to encourage him, remembering what we've already seen in uh, 1 Timothy, that there was, this is what it takes for church order. Here's how to make sure that things are as they're supposed to be, that they are proper and, and handled correctly. But I, I think I said it a couple of times during the, the 1 Timothy study, 
a person put in his condition, it's not for the faint of heart. It can be incredibly frustrating at times. And the idea that you're, you're the person that's been put there in the place of oversight for an entire church, and yet that church can sometimes be filled with people that create so much drama and trouble. And if I'm thinking about it in our current times, it happened in times past, obviously. We saw some examples that he had given of that. But let's face it, any church that is filled with people is going to have in it its own problems and no two are alike. All churches are different. But when you fill it with people who are very easily moved to one thing or another uh, and emotions and, and everything else can run high, it can be discouraging. Or it can be something on a more personal level with Timothy. The devil loves to cast doubt on, on uh, any person that's put in that kind of a place, can stir up any types of trouble. We just genuinely don't know if there's anything in particular that, was, uh, that Paul is looking to address because he doesn't give specifics, or if it's just a general encouragement to him not to become discouraged, and that idea of praying for him day and night, that, that he would be ex um, excited about ministry as Paul was. So it's, it's again, we, you, it's hard to know how to take away from this because, again, we're lacking specifics, so we can speak about it in the most general of terms. So he says, of Paul, I remember you day and night in my prayer, verse 4, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. And so there again, there's the question. Is there something in particular that, that Timothy is struggling with? Or is it his his tears and everything is um, the concern that he has for Paul? And so, you know, depending on who you ask, um, there are different schools of thought and all of the above could be possible as well. So is Timothy in a place of, of trouble? And could he be being troubled by things in the church that are taking place or the world as a whole? Is it Paul's world? Is it all of those things? Let's remember that the devil loves to heap despair upon us. And so um, you could easily relate the two things together. There's a world that is putting pressure on the church and Paul is a great example of that because he sits in prison. Is that what Timothy's tears are about? Again, we're not told any of those would work, and if we're going to make application to our times, recognizing that there are many things that the devil puts out in order to try to discourage us. So what then is the remedy, if you will? The remedy is people around you that you can have fellowship with, that you can depend upon and rely upon, people that will pray for you, people that will fellowship with you, people that will come alongside and weep and mourn if necessary or rejoice, whatever the case may be. That is the, the remedy that God has put in place, if you think about it. He's given us the church for that reason. So we see here, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I recall to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which uh, dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is also in you. This idea of being persuaded is that I'm convinced. I know that this is the fact. <clears throat> and notice the... <clears throat> I'm sorry, the chain of custody, if you will. It started with your grandmother, and then it came to your mother, and then it has now been put on to you. We know that from chapter 3, in fact, we could take a look there real quick. Uh, in chapter 3, very, very famous, if you will, kind of chapter. I'm sorry. Um, it's actually in the, the last book that we were in. It's in 1 Timothy. And let's go there real quick. I am so sorry. It is 2 Timothy. It's chapter 3. After he has mentioned Lois and Eunice in the, uh, in the first chapter, which we'll get to and we'll finish out there in a moment, remember what he says here in chapter 3, verse 14, but you must continue in the things that you have learned and have been assured of, knowing from whom you, <coughs> you have learned them. So you can uh, make the case that Paul is speaking about himself, the person that he's learned them from. <clears throat> but the first chapter here seems to indicate that, um, at, at least initially, it came through the ministry of his grandmother and his mother. And so that is uh, Paul bringing back into remembrance. This is what you can be reminded of as I am reminded of it. And that, that great legacy, if you will, that there is that has brought him to this place. <clears throat> so verse 6, therefore. So knowing where you've learned them from, this 
relationship that, that Paul and Timothy have, this encouragement that comes from Paul, desiring to see him, praying for him all the time. Therefore, Timothy, again, we don't have specifics here. So it's best not to read anything into it. We'll just speak about it in the most general of senses. This doesn't uh, have to bring us to the place where we think that somehow Timothy is stuck in this place of crisis, uh, spiritually speaking. This could be just a general encouragement, not knowing, because remember, the time that it would take for information to travel between the two places could take such a long time. So as Paul is waiting for this letter to travel to him, having been a while since there's been any kind of correspondence that we know of, <clears throat> and again, it would take a while to travel either way, by Paul writing this, this could be very much general. Don't become discouraged, Timothy, not knowing all of the dynamics that are going on at the time. There's so much of a, of a gulf of distance between them and trying to get messages back and forth. It would give the impression more that this is, let me give you general encouragement in case it is necessary. And to some extent, it's always going to be necessary. There's always pressures on the church. <clears throat> so verse 6, Therefore, I remind you then to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands, from 1 Timothy 4, that the elders had uh, had raised him up and laid hands upon him, and uh, that they sent him out, basically. It's like what they, they did with Paul and Barnabas when they sent them out initially, um, back in, uh, what, 13th chapter of the book of Acts, when they were um, sectioned out or, or, or uh, called out by the Holy Spirit and then sent out by the church with their blessing and their commission, if you will. Kind of the same thing takes place that we hear mentioned of in chapter 4, uh, verse 14 of 1 Timothy. Paul is reminding about this. Now, there's an interesting thing, again, causes people to speculate that um, that they're, they're thinking that Paul makes mention of this because he's heard that Timothy may be in some place of difficulty and really needs to be encouraged. Well, that again, there's nothing that tells us that. We're just, that's an assumption by some, but there's no, there's nothing in here that tells us that. So again, this may very well be general and without any kind of specifics, it's always good to remember that, that whatever God has done in your life, the, uh, the picture that's here is stirring up. You, you find it also in the book of Hebrews and other places. And it is just the idea of, we can think of coals and things that uh, would be embers. And the longer that they've burned without agitation, they get that kind of ash over the top of them. And uh, it's not until they're agitated that, that all the, the, uh, the ash and the things that are on the outside kind of get removed and the heat comes back from it. It can be rekindled at that point. So if you ever want to test the theory, take a bunch of coals and whatnot, throw a piece of paper on it, and uh, it may just turn a little bit brown, but it might not catch fire. Stir up the coals a little bit, knock off the ash and have the embers good and hot, throw that paper on and it will ignite. And this is what Paul is kind of getting around to. And so the idea of stirring up this, the gifting that's put upon you. Now, again, he doesn't speak about any specific kind of gifting other than we can just imply from it. It's whatever God had commissioned him to do as being a teacher and whatever else there may be. He has gifts that were given to him that God has bestowed upon him, using him in those ways. And so if he's put the calling of teaching upon his life and pastoring and those kind of things, it would be an ongoing gifting, but it's, it's remember those things, stir those things up. Don't let them get a skin over them. Don't let them have uh, any kind of ash grow on them. Keep them in a place of agitation and keep them hot, if you will. So therefore, I remind you, stir up the gift of God, which, was, uh, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Uh, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So this is one that you hear people quote all the time. Let's leave it in its context and then we'll make application. So it is for Paul to remember this idea of what is given to us. All of these things are not, they're, they're not things that are there naturally. So they are things that are put there by others. <clears throat> so in this case, the, the positive things, the power, love, and sound mind are put there by God. If there is anything that is discouraging this <clears throat> spirit, excuse me, <clears throat> it is allergy season here. So um, that, that tickle in your throat, sorry. When, um, when Paul is mentioning these kind of things that, that um, the devil would always want to uh, 
give us a, a fearful spirit about any number of things. We can be worried about tomorrow. We can be worried about things in the church. We can be worried about world events. We can be worried about any number of things. But let's remember that worry is not something that God puts upon us. God can alert us to things, but he's not going to alert us to something causing fear with no remedy. So Paul wants to make sure that there's a contrast. One thing we can know, we can know is God hasn't put some kind of paralyzing fear on each of us. Here's what he has given to us. Power, love, and sound mind. First one is power, uh, the power of the Greek word dunamis, and that is where we will get things like dynamic and that it is expansive and moving forward in the dynamo sense. Dynamite is taken from that as well, that explosion. And what it just is supposed to mean is that there is a dynamic power behind us. This is speaking of the work of the Spirit for sure. <clears throat> Not just in the sense of signs and wonders types of things, but um, more in, the, in the, uh, the coming into the gifting that's been put upon him. If God's called him to be a pastor or an evangelist or whatever it is that he's supposed to be doing, it is the Spirit who empowers him, who provides for him that dunamis. The same promise that was given to the church in uh, Acts chapter 1 by Jesus and then seen for the first time um, where everybody could see it in the book of Acts chapter 2. But that's not just about tongues. It's about all of the works of the Holy Spirit. Peter then takes on that gifting of evangelism, and he preaches the message based on what God had done with the speaking of tongues, and thousands get saved through it. So it's when the Holy Spirit began to not only indwell the believer, but then work supernaturally through them. That's what's being spoken of here. So God has not given us a spirit. where He hasn't been the one who has given that that feeling about us or, or that, that sensation about us and how we conduct ourselves. When people look at them, a person say they've got a spirit of whatever. It's not like there's this ghost in them. That's not what's being spoken of. It's their demeanor. It's their character. It's their spirit. So that's what's being spoken of here. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but rather of dynamic, uh, dynamic, dynamism, and the, the, the power that is there. Power also then of love, agape, and it's not just brotherly love. It is that sacrificial kind of love. It is that I will pay whatever the cost is necessary to satisfy it, but a power, love, and then of a sound mind, and that's just simply disciplined, a disciplined mind that is not given to fits of anger and rage and overreaction. There is a temperance that is a part of this as well. So of all the people in a church, the pastor should exemplify these best as anybody. There shouldn't be anybody in the, in the fellowship that really does them better. There may be people who do them like what the pastor does, but he needs to be that example. So when a congregation looks at the pastor, what do they see? Fearful? If so, God did not put that there. Do they see him as dynamic and one who God uses in a dynamic way? Is he a person who does what he does in a very loving sense? And that's not just in the person-to-person -person kind of thing, but does he love the flock in the way that he would stand in the way of, if the devil were to show up and try to hurt them, would he stand in that way of being shepherd? Does he love them enough to teach them accurately, even if it may be dif uh, dis uh, uh, Difficult for them to hear and uncomfortable, uh, perhaps? Sure, that if you love them, you will tell them. And then also, sound mind. Does that person have a moderation and a temperance to them? Are they given to fits of anger or are they stable? Those are the kind of things that are seeing that are being said here. So, Timothy, just realize, God has not given us a power, a, a spirit, rather, of fear. Instead, it's one that is exemplified in these ways. Power, love, sound mind. So then verse 8, therefore, and since that the, that is the case, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. So what do we have in the way of history? We know who Jesus is. We know what he did. We know what he uh, accomplished by death, resurrection, and ascension. We know what he accomplished by uh, sending the Holy Spirit. And we know that what he accomplished at the cross was the forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. And we know the the, the way to get there, if you will. We've been given the map. So don't be ashamed of, of what Jesus had to go through, what he did, what he taught, who he was, the way that he was viewed by some in the world. Don't be troubled by that. Same thing with Paul. Now remember, Paul is now in prison. We're going to see by the end of this chapter that there are some who must have viewed his imprisonment in, in some ways. How can a man of God be put in jail, if that's the case, or not wanting to suffer the same fate, have distanced themselves from Paul? There could be any number of ex explanations for it. 
But here Paul is saying to Timothy, if you're not being, if you're not ashamed of Jesus, don't be ashamed of me because I'm just doing what he's put me here to do. So Timothy, follow the, the, the line of progression, if you will. There was Jesus. Jesus had, had raised me up to, to do this thing. Now I'm raising you up to do this. Keep the line, if you will, going. This is one of those really cool things. A little anecdotal thing. Um, I remember in the time um, after my pastor uh, had, had become very ill and, uh, and eventually when he had passed, there was a question that was going on because Pastor Chuck had taken ill as well. And the question was, what's going to happen as far as the continuation was concerned of, of the way that, that Calvary's always been? And my answer was very simple. As far as can something last indefinitely, um, the answer is a, a resounding yes, absolutely. But it requires a couple of things. That the discipler, the person who is doing the discipling, is, is as locked in as he could ever be and has always been. And that the person who is then the disciple, are they as locked in as the person who is instructing them? And are they going to continue without any, any delusion and without any kind of watering down what was left to them? If that's the case, it would last indefinitely. The problem is when a person who is incredibly dedicated, my pastor was, Pastor Chuck was, if those men who are absolutely dedicated are able to pass it on to people who are very like-minded in their dedication, it will go on indefinitely. Let's be reminded, we are reading a book that is 2,000 years old. And if we could say, I take the Word of God with the same... Um, with the same gravity and importance as I believe that Paul did and that Timothy did, and you can put yourself in that line, that you don't have to be a pastor to, to be this person. Do you believe everything as they did best as we can tell, or are we saying, well, that was for that time, it's not as important to us now? Um, it's those people that would say, making some kind of excuses for it, they're the ones that would be the problem. And it's not going to continue with any kind of power. Take a look at the church today. That's most of the church, frankly. But it depends on the person that is discipling and the person that is being discipled. And if there is really no breakdown from one generation to the next, it can go on indefinitely. And so there you have it. <clears throat> now, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. So it's the power of God that will sustain you as it sustained me and as it kept Jesus knowing that that was his reason for being here. Don't become discouraged, Timothy. Don't be ashamed of this line of people that you follow and be willing to pay the price that we've paid. And so tall order. And I, boy, I wish that this was a, a, a thing. Boy, talk about bittersweet. Um, I love the idea that there are people who are put in such difficult positions without wavering. And at the same time, I'm reminded, I am thankful that I live in the United States. Because uh, up to this point, though it seems to get weirder by the day, it hasn't really cost us a great deal to be a believer. But I could only hope that if that day ever came, that I wouldn't myself personally shy away from what it is that God has called me to do, that I would be willing to pay whatever price. Remember, Paul's imprisoned here. And who knows what would happen with Timothy? It's the same world, and Timothy is probably known better than anybody else in the world at the time as being very much like Paul. So, you know, Timothy would have that target on his back as well. And Paul's encouraging him that in that, but don't, don't use it as a reason to go underground and don't cloak yourself. So verse 9, this Jesus, the one who has saved us, and he has called us with a holy calling. It's not according to our works, but it is according to his own purpose and his grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Again, these are great reminders, and Paul says them just kind of like very, very quickly. But he's saying, Timothy, starting with Jesus, we know everything that we need to know in order to proclaim the good news and the truth of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of it. And just recognize that everything that would happen, everything that we've been called to, every element of truth, everything that we could share in the sense of the gospel was put in place by God before anything was even created. So all of it is ultimately in his control. It would be good for every one of us to be reminded of that at all of, of that truth at all times. Because if it was true in Timothy and Paul, it is true in us today.
Is there anything that would happen to us on a day-by-day -day basis that God is not already aware of? They've been in place before time was, so that means he is also prepared for them. That also means that we need to be looking to him and be locked in on who he is and what he's doing in us and not be in a place of fearfulness. So super, super important truths that he's putting out here. And he says them so matter-of-factly, but they're so profound. So he says in verse uh, 10, but he is now, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher and, a, and an apostle and a, uh, a teacher of the Gentiles. What a mouthful this is. But there is a, a great thing, and it would be a, it's a wonderful visual for when we're trying to explain what Jesus did and what he accomplished at the cross. Um, it is misunderstood. It is often not really explained very well by the church. Um, and because I, I think oftentimes the church is not so concerned with teaching accurately the scripture, but rather trying to instantly take it from reading a verse to trying to make it into some kind of an application and then robbing it of, of its essential truth. And it's a major thing that he says here. Let's read through it really quick. Um, in fact, let's read verse 9 into 10 so I don't lose the continuity of the text. This Jesus that he's speaking about, he's the one who has saved us, called us with a holy calling, and it's not according to our works. It's nothing that we have done to accomplish it. Instead, it is according to his own purpose and grace. So he's the one who provides, not us. His own purpose and his own grace, which was given to us, once again, that idea of given, it was bestowed upon us, given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God had ever desired, his purpose and grace, was put in place before the world was, but now it has been shown to everyone in the person of Jesus Christ. Think about what that's, that's saying. God knew man would fall. God knew what it was going to take to reconcile mankind. It was going to take Jesus becoming a man and living among us and giving his life on a cross so that he could reconcile mankind back to him. That's why Paul says something amazing here. And that Jesus Christ, the one who has abolished, it means he has annulled death. He has abolished death and instead, or in replace of it, he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So the gospel is also what man's side of this is, is as well. God has provided the means for Jesus or for eternal life in the person of Jesus, the one who by his actions has put death to death. He's abolished it. He has robbed it of any power. Yet the gospel would say it's an offer that's given, but man must receive that gift that is offered to him. And I'm not going to get into the whole discussion about Calvinism. Does man have the ability or does God make him do it? Again, it's not, I'm not arguing Calvinism anymore. It's just tedious. I am one who believes that God has given man the, uh, the free will and the capacity to make the decision. He has done that in his sovereignty. And again, it's really not up for debate as far as I'm concerned. But if we understand that, Jesus provided the means by which sin would be abolished. It would be erased and removed from us. It would be taken away and it would be annulled. They would have no longer any power. But the gospel and all of, of what it means, God has put it there, but it needs to be accepted and received. And so it's an offer and that offer is then accepted and received. And therefore, these things can come to light. We can have sin um, and death or death rather, um, we can have that abolished, and then we can have life brought in instead through the understanding the truth of the gospel. God loves us. God provided a means of salvation. Jesus died on the cross. And then this is the only way to heaven. Here is the opportunity offered to mankind. Do you accept? Do you receive? Yes or no? Heaven or hell? Your sin is a disqualifying um, series of events in your life. You have fallen short of the glory of God. However, God has made a way. So that's where Paul would tell us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in the person of Christ Jesus. Again, take it or leave it. There are your options. So, verse 11, to which I was appointed to be a preacher and an apostle and a teacher to the Gentiles. So this is what God has put me on this earth to do at a time 
you know, in his life, he never would have believed that that's the case. But notice once again, this is something that he was appointed to do. God placed him in that place to do these things. A preacher, one who would go and proclaim. So a preacher, an apostle, one who is sent. And then a teacher, one who would give instruction to the Gentiles. He mentions them by name. Now, we know that Paul would go and speak with Jews all the time, but Paul recognized that his ministry was very much unique to anyone in the church to that time. The first time we hear Gentiles being mentioned in Mass, and, and uh, you know, as a, as a group, I should say, because people may not understand what I mean by in Mass, as a group, um, Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter did that in Acts chapter 10 when he went to Cornelius, the centurion's house there at Caesarea. So that was when it first went there, but he was certainly not the apostle that was sent to the Gentiles. That was clearly Paul, and Paul makes mention of it, says it right here. Verse 12, now, for this reason, I have also suffered these things. So imprisonment, stoning, persecution, death threats, all the things that have followed him and plagued him his whole time. Again, he's not complaining, he's just making a statement. The, for this reason, I have suffered all of these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know who I in whom I have believed, and I am also persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until this day. That same kind of that same kind of persuasion is that confidence. I believe this. I know that this is true. So I'm persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day, when I see him face to face. Everything that I have done of offering myself, every promise that I've made to him, every every oath, if you will, everything that I have done in service to him, he will bring the, the fruit of all of my, my reasons why I do the things that I do. When I see him face to face, every bit of, of trust and hope and faith that I have had in him will be realized in its entirety when I see him face to face. So that's intended to be an encouragement to Timothy. Now notice what he's supposed to do. Hold fast then. Holding fast uh, simply means it's it's kind of, um, it's like you take possession of it. It's something that you, you hold to yourself. Okay, I get it. I understand it. I'm going to accept that. I'll receive it to myself. I'm not going to give it back out as though not keeping it for myself. I'll share it with, with anyone who asks. I want to make sure that they know it as well. But I'm going to hold fast to it. I will make it a part of my life and then pass it on to other people without losing it for myself. So it's those things that he says, hold fast, what? The pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, maintained by Christ Jesus. So notice it's not hold fast salvation. It's hold fast the words that I have given. It means hold them to you where you say, I believe this because I was taught this. Paul was the one who had instructed me and I believe these things to be so. If I wanna use myself in the sense, any of us can do the same thing. We know who the people were that were instrumental that God used in the early times of our life as a believer. Those were the people that we heard their words, we held them. That may be more than one. In this case, Paul saying to Timothy, you've heard the things that I have said to you. Now grab onto those things, hold them, believe them, keep them to yourself, and then give them out to others. We see that right there in verse 14 of the next chapter. Remind them of these things, things that were sound words that Paul was saying at that point, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. So once again, Paul puts this out and says, you've heard from me, and so pass it on. Timothy, remind those that you have of these things. And we'll get to that when we when we get to chapter 2 next week, the things that Paul is then instructing to Timothy and then saying to Timothy, pass those along. Now, <clears throat> Verse uh, 13, one more time. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. So believing them because you love those truths, because they are they are seen as faithful. And uh, as he says, um, do so and by the power, not only the, the realization of them shown to you by Jesus, but he's the one who provides you the ability to continue on in these things. That good thing which was committed to you Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So again, this is the, the understanding that you can't do these things in your own strength. Notice who is now also brought into the equation. The, uh, the, the ability to maintain and continue on is in the person of the Holy Spirit, who Jesus said the be, would be the one who would lead you and guide you in my absence. So remembering that the 
the truth of what we believe is founded upon the, the teachings and the completed, finished work of Jesus. From his teaching to his offering of himself for the sin of mankind to his resurrection and the empowering then sending of the Holy Spirit who picks up where he left off, if you will, guiding and leading the church, the one who empowers us. So he says, um, that good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. He is the one who will empower. Now he goes in the opposite direction. That's you, Timothy, but know also that there is an op there's an opposite side of this. And there are those people who will take their eyes off and notice what he says about them. This you know, that all those who are in Asia, they have turned away from me, among whom are Phrygellus and Hermogenes. Now, we know nothing about these guys. Timothy would. <clears throat> and as I started this earlier, remember I had made mention that uh, as far as Timothy was concerned, um, it's a letter that Paul wrote directly to him. And so since now there are people that are being mentioned here and some things that had happened and have, some had left, but other ones, one in particular has, has stuck by him, it, it's obvious that Timothy would be able to know who these people are. He would know them by face. He would know by what they had maybe done. He would certainly know in detail what things had taken place. He wouldn't need an explanation. That's why Paul doesn't give one to him. It's not necessary for us to know because Paul didn't record it. The Holy Spirit did not prompt him to record it. So not knowing exactly what the offenses were, how long it took, what they were, what shape they took, we know none of those things. It's not important. Because what we can see is in our, probably our, around our own lives, the longer that we've been around, we may know people who have abandoned us, especially if you're in a place where you've done a lot of ministry and you've done a lot of teaching. You have your versions of, uh, of um, I had to look their names again because they're just weird, Phrygellus and Hermogenes. We know who these people are again. We don't have to know them by face. We know what they're like in the modern times. So he said there are a whole bunch of people that have left. There seems to be something particularly evil about what these guys did because Paul says everyone has done this, but those two guys are singled out. Brings an interesting point up because there are those times that we will hear from, from people who want to uh, kind of discourage us from even mentioning people by name if uh, by chance they have um, uh, started to teach things. And maybe if they're even people who have been close to us or people around ministry, when they get into teaching all kinds of false doctrine, and uh, if we would make mention of them even by name, there are no shortage of people who will say, you can't do that. You can't talk about them by name. You can't call them out. You can't blah, blah, blah. You're hurting the unity. I've heard all the lame excuses that there have been offered all, all this time. Here Paul does exactly that, that there are these people who have done incredible harm. And these are people that he's speaking about in the sense that they have, these are people who have abandoned the faith as he sees it. They have abandoned Paul, and not just in the physical sense, but they would be a distancing themselves from him entirely. And so Paul sees them as very much unlike Timothy. Um, and so he said, here's a couple of examples of guys just like him. So we know in other places, Romans, the last chapter there, he talks about people that are like this, that have strayed from doctrine, you're to mark them. That means know who they are by name and avoid them entirely. Those two things go hand in hand. Know who they are and have nothing to do with them. He would say the same of these guys. So um, let's read verse 15 again. This you know that all those in Asia who turned away from me, among whom are Phrygellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy, though, this is the total opposite to the household. That's all who were in the house uh, of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously, and he found me. So here's the total opposite. The guys who had abandoned me, in minimum, at minimum, the guys who said, we don't want anything to do with any affiliation with Paul because whatever it is that he's done, he's now in jail. We don't want anything to do with him. Um, a guy that's mentioned here, Onesiphorus, would look at, at Paul and say, well, he's in jail, but it's not because he's done anything wrong. He's kind of a political prisoner, if you will, and he's been forceful. The devil has, has stirred up the right people. God has allowed it. Now he's in chains. Paul, in his, in his things that he says... Hey, I'm, I'm 
you know, being used in here and people are coming to faith through this. So even in his imprisonment, Paul said, it's a mission field. So wherever it is that God puts me, that's where I'm going to do whatever he's called me to do. And I'll look to him for opportunity. And so Paul never saw himself as a victim. He just saw himself as a man in time and whatever it is that God was doing at that particular time, he wanted to be useful. So he says, let me give you examples. And in the back of his mind, as Timothy reads this, you would think that he's able to sit back and go, yeah, there's those guys, just the ones that Paul's talking about. I know exactly what those guys have done. But then he contrasts it with Onesiphorus and says he's the total difference of that. The idea of refreshing is that when Paul would come there, this would be a guy who would just give him all kinds of reason for encouragement. And imagine Paul to single out one guy and say, this guy was such an encouragement to me. Here's what he did when he got to Rome. He had to find out where I was and did so in all kinds of zeal. He was like motivated to find me, and he did. And so he's the total opposite of, of the other two that are just mentioned here. So he says about him in verse, um, verse 18, So may the Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. And so his whole thing is, I just, I look forward to the day that God repays him for his generosity. It's just, it's said in kind of an odd way. Uh, there's not, anybody who knows anything about anything who would be able to look at this and say, for a person that is continuing on in the Lord, and Paul never even says it, boy, I just hope that he continues on in the Lord. That's already assumed. And so then the excitement is that when he sees God face to face, that God would reward him for just his diligence and for what an encouragement he's been. Paul looks at him as exactly that. He's such an encouragement to me. And that day that he sees God face to face, that God would reward him for the things that he has done. And so it's, it's a very human kind of a thing to say. It's not supposed to be said as some very deep theological. Is that possible? Is it not possible? Does Paul have his doubts? Just stop. There are times when humans are humans. And he looks at this man and is so thankful for how wonderful he has been to Paul when so many others abandon him. And so his, his ending of that whole thing is him and his whole household. I pray that God just rewards them. And that when he sees God face to face, that he'll come into a full realization of everything that God laid hold of him for. So it's great when we read those kind of things and say the application part for us too. Would you want to be put in the... Uh, the camp of Phrygellus and Hermogenes, or do you want to be in the camp of Onesiphorus? And it's not because of how we would have treated Paul. It's what we do in our world here and now, that there are those who have been faithful to minister the gospel, and we would support them in any way possible. And we would want to follow their lead, whether that's Timothy, whether it's Onesiphorus, or being unlike the other people who, when it became difficult for them, for whatever reasons, they decided to abandon and uh, and kind of leave Paul adrift. So really interesting things. And again, this is just kind of the opening uh, parts of the chapter, or of the book, rather. Uh, Paul's going to get into some very, very weighty things about um, what the, the Scripture is for, the warnings of the end, uh, end of days, uh, Paul says some very, very interesting things in this, but he begins it by just saying, Timothy, let me give you encouragement. Don't become discouraged. Just recognize that doing what we do, it's, it's going to come at a cost, but don't let that be a problem. Don't see what's going on with me, Paul would say, as some reason to not continue on in these things, but rather embrace them. I embraced them, Paul would be able to say. I embraced them because Jesus is the one who encouraged me and it's him that I pursue after, do likewise. And so, again, remembering circumstances are what they are, but they're not to dictate to us how we live and how we walk and how we function. He gives that little bit of detail there, and then he explains that even in his difficulty, it really does have that effect on the people around him. Some could not deal with it. Others were just willing to say, wait, Paul's always been on the wrong, or on the right track, rather. Um, I'll do everything that I can to support him. That's what God had called Onesiphorus to do. So you, there's so many good examples in this. So we'll conclude with that. Uh, we'll pick it up at chapter 2 next week. Um, I know I made mention of it uh, in the Ezra study earlier this week. We have uh, some details on the trip that's coming up to Israel that we're going to try to take in spring of 2023. Again, not knowing what the world will look like. We're assuming that it will be functioning and that we're not stuck in some... 
other pan uh, pandemic paranoia that, that's gone on. But if the world is as it is right now in July of, uh, of 2022, and the world is open to travel, and uh, we have the means by which we could pay for such a thing, contact me through the website. Uh, we also have a, uh, a newsletter that's being put out. You can uh, hit, um, uh, hit the email uh, button there at the website for the ministry, which is oldpaththeology.net, and uh, ask to be put on that newsletter. We've got something come out in the next week or so and uh, kind of give you some details on things taking place. And uh, we will continue on in chapter two as we work our, three, uh, our way through the New Testament and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, at our next study. Mm -hmm.